All right, what is up, Brad fans? How you living? Safely, distanced, not too lonely, I hope. Uh, let me know. Why don't you let me know how you're doing? Uh, at 2 brad for you on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, 2 brad for you at gmail.com. You can email the show. You can hit up the website, 2 brad for youwordpresscom and there's a comment form there. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know what you want to talk about. Send a end of year prediction, do years prediction, whatever you want. We would love to hear from you. Also, if you are hearing this, I assume that you already subscribe and follow the show uh, wherever you get your podcasts. If you don't, please do that. You can also leave a comment and a rating. That helps boost our visibility. We would really appreciate that. Thank you. Now, today, we are talking about coronavirus vaccines. Real talk. We ain't going to pull any punches here because I know that a lot of people are actually a little hesitant about this vaccine. Um, I've heard it from a number of listeners, from friends of listeners, from friends here in Germany, from friends back in Canada, uh, just having some questions. And there's a bit of, you know, uncertainty and certain things swirling around in the social media, internet ether that make people just, you know, a, a little bit wary of of the new vaccine. And to be honest, I understand. I get it. Um, so I'm going to do my best. You know, I've done a lot of research on this. Uh, I know a fair bit about vaccines. Um, and I follow all of the experts. So I will give you some of my takes, my opinions. Um, but also, like I said, solid solid research as to what we know about these vaccines um, and some coronavirus real talk. Here we go. Let's do it. Mm. All right, folks. Point number one, real talk. That's the real talk sound. Um, is This isn't about anti-vax or vax. This isn't, you know, I'm not... I'm not speaking to the anti-vax folks with this. That's not who this message is intended for because, you know, that community, their ideas are very easily debunked. You know, the links to autism, sowing fear about profiteering, microchipping, you know, vaccines aren't safe. All of that is thoroughly debunkable. Um, but they are a loud group and when we have a situation like we do with these new coronavirus vaccines that are rolling out super fast and they are based on a new technology, people can be hesitant about those two things and those two points can get hijacked by an anti-vax group or an anti-vax narrative or something like that. And I think it's really important that public health messaging and science podcasts, science journalists, whatever, you know, this is what I choose to do with my time, um, has a strong message that just tells people the information, gives them the straight up information, you know, the real talk about these things so that, you know, there's less room for that misinformation to grow. And this is what I'm hearing from a number of, of listeners and friends and family and stuff who are who are a little hesitant, a little worried. It, it boils down to this, the fact that these things were produced so quickly. And even the name, you know, the 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 American effort to make the vaccine or to fund the vaccine research warp speed, you know, things like this. We've talked about this in previous episodes. It it adds to that sort of fear like, oh, oh shit, this thing has really been rushed, you know, so maybe they cut corners and stuff like that. So that's one thing. And then just the fact that this is, yeah, a, let's say a new delivery system for vaccines, the mRNA vaccines. Um, you may have heard about adenovirus um, vaccines uh, and chimpanzee virus vaccines. These are all related in how they work they're just slightly different in um how they're sort of delivering the vaccine component uh so we'll break all this down for you in this episode um uh, to hopefully ease some of the concerns 
um, around the rollout of the corona vaccines because we are seeing them coming. They're arriving. I think healthcare workers in Canada and the United States, I am recording this on Tuesday, December 15th, are starting to get doses either today or tomorrow. Uh, and the UK has already started rolling it out. Uh, here in the EU, we haven't got uh, emergency approval yet, but that is, it's just a matter of time. So let's start with the idea that these vaccines have been rushed or, you know, they, they came out so quickly. So something must have been, you know, a wrong or corners cut or something like that. And I want to start with um, the fact that nothing has really changed in terms of the principle behind vaccines um, and the regulation behind vaccines. So you know, quick refresh here. Uh, vaccines, of course, are used to uh, promote or provoke a immune response in your body um, that creates antibodies towards a specific virus, bacteria, whatever it is, antigen. We call that an antigen. So whatever it is that allows the body to recognize this thing as a pathogen, as something foreign, as a disease-causing thing, um, your body makes antibodies to that so that next time you encounter it, you already have this memory of it and you can quickly produce these antibodies and attack this thing before it can you know, get hold of your body. Um, so the way that that's normally done, that's traditionally be done with vaccines, is you grow some virus or something Fresh like this. Look at that, Good Dustin deal. Hoffman's here with us today. Um, and then you you culture it, you weaken it, you kill it, and then you introduce that to the body so that it provokes the immune response but doesn't get you sick. That's the whole goal of vaccine is to like promote the, the provoke the immune response without you actually getting sick. So none of that has changed. Even though we're dealing with what we're hearing are new vaccines and stuff, the principle is the same. And what we'll come to see later is that it's just the way in which we are presenting the specific part of the virus, in this case, coronaviruses, to the immune system so that it can get that, can get provoked into that response um, is slightly different. It's different than just growing it up, snapping a piece off or weakening it, killing it, and then using that in the vaccine. Also importantly, the process hasn't changed. So clinical trials, um, all of the work that goes into uh, laboratory studies, animal studies, everything like that, um, before you would even get to a clinical trial, none of that has changed. Nothing has changed. So we have a really good handle on vaccines and how to um, make them work, how to get them to work. We've done it for decades, you know, since I think smallpox vaccine has been around since the early 1900s. Um, so we understand how vaccines provoke the immune response. Uh, we know what signals to look for to know that it is working as intended. Um, we know what reactions to expect, which ones to try and avoid if we do see them, all of that kind of thing. We know what data we would need in order to say um, how safe a vaccine is. You know, we have good thresholds of you know, what is the acceptable level of risk? There's always some risk, but of course we know that with vaccines, there's some of the safest medical interventions around. The risks of having a very serious complication from a vaccine is extremely low. Um, and so that none of that has changed. So these new coronavirus vaccines will have to go through the same process, the same regulatory methods, hurdles, clinical trials, all of that stuff. Um, so if there were any troubling signs, they would have been caught in the Clint phase three trials. And in fact, you know, you may have heard in August and early fall about some of the trials being halted, um, because, you know, someone had a serious reaction and they had to go and, and find out if that was because of the vaccine or just some other coincidental, um, disease or infection or something that they had. Uh, and then they restarted the trials again. So everything was working as it would, as you would expect. There's been really nothing different in terms of the regulation, the trials, everything like that um, with these new vaccines. In fact, 
I think the phase three trials, clinical trials for both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, you know, they had upwards of like 40,000 people, 30,000 people, something like this, tens of thousands of people in these trials, which is quite robust for a phase three trial. I mean, some phase three trials only have um, 3,000 people or 300 people. Um, so they were quite good trials in terms of recruiting a large number of people. And obviously that's good because, you know, so many, you know, people are so different on just an individual level in terms of their, um, the allergies they might have, how their immune system is, you know, slightly different. We all have slightly different immune systems, slightly different genetics, all that kind of thing. So by getting such a like such a large group of people, you're actually testing the vaccine in a broad, you know, spectrum of the diversity of humans that there are so you would see if there's some you know rare condition that would cause a vaccine reaction you're hopefully getting that in these in these trials and so it's one of the reasons these trials were so big and actually kind of you know oddly perverse or dark or whatever the fact that in the u.s and in brazil and i mean even in europe uh the uk you know because the the virus is so widespread because it's ripping through populations right now um that actually speeds up a lot of the trials because again quickly the way that these phase three trials will work is that you say you have forty thousand people twenty thousand get the vaccine twenty thousand get a placebo or some other vaccine um just to kind of you know make it more like uh more like the other side of the of the trial um anyway it doesn't matter Twenty thousand people get the get the coronavirus vaccine Twenty thousand get a placebo or a control vaccine and then you have to wait and see um they have a a, a defined threshold of once we see that out of these forty thousand people because they don't know who got what even the researchers don't know who got what once they see uh, a percentage of those people get get COVID, then they can look at the data and see whether they those people got the the coronavirus vaccine or the control or placebo, and then that's how you know um, how effective it is, how effective the vaccine is. And in this case, it was like you know they waited till they got like I think it was roughly like two hundred cases or something like that. Might might even been less. Um, And they were overwhelmingly in the placebo group. So that's how you know that the coronavirus is uh, vaccine is effective, right? Because I did presumably all of these 40,000 people are all facing the same exposure risk. So if you if you had a situation where uh, there wasn't rampant disease, what wasn't rampant virus floating around, it would take a really long time to see those 200 cases and then be able to look at your data and see who had what and and how it worked. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of shitty that, well, it is shitty that the virus is, is, is around, but it actually is speeding up trials. And so the, the vaccines that are coming behind Pfizer and Moderna, ones that are based on more traditional, um, uh, methods will also, you know, they will come faster because we have this situation where there's so much, chance that people are going to get uh infected so that's just a little on the how the vaccines work or the how the trials work rather and um takeaway point real talk is that nothing has changed nothing has changed in terms of regulation no corners have been cut nothing like that um but there's you know these are some of the factors as to why it's it's coming so quickly you know we have a really robust phase three trial that was able to progress quickly because there was so much um, virus in the in the world. Um, the second part about why these things um, have, co- have come along so, so quickly um, compared to other vaccines that we that we've worked on and stuff, it, it, it's two, it's twofold. It's, it's the technology, this new delivery system, as I'm calling it, the mRNA vaccines, the adenovirus, the genetic vaccines, which I'll get to in a second. But it's also kind of related to what I was just talking about with the 
clinical trials and there's virus just ripping through the world. So there's a real need for these. I mean, we haven't needed a vaccine this urgently in a long time. The vaccines that we have, that we use, have been developed for decades. You know, we've vaccines have eliminated a lot of the diseases that used to be, you know, the urgent health problems, polio, smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, all these diseases that used to be global and kill or maim thousands of people, many of them children, you know, have been dealt with. So we haven't seen, you know, vaccine development uh, in the media, you know, in in this kind of way. So it's it part of this, I think, promotes this or contributes to this idea that, oh my God, these things are being rushed. Um, well, it's just we haven't seen a situation of, of great need like this before. So vaccine development is still going on. Um, but just not the same intensity. And so then there's a mix of, you know, political, financial, and scientific issues that contribute to why, you know, vaccines aren't, don't move as fast as this one. Um, And like I mentioned, it can be simply the fact that you don't have enough cases to do a really robust, um, fast clinical trial. You need, you know, that clinical trial might play out over years if it's a rare condition. Uh, There's also the unfortunate financial situation where if nobody wants to pony up the money for development because it's a disease like um, malaria that only affects uh, sub-Saharan Africa and poorer parts of South America, you know, things like that, then yeah, I mean, that's that's an unfortunate reality and, and people like Bill Gates, you know, the evil Bill Gates are actually big um contributors to solving that problem they put up a shit ton of money uh of their own without expecting anything back um so yeah so that's you know a bit one of the just you know simplest reasons that these things have 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 seemingly burst onto the scene so so quickly is just (laughs) we threw a ton of money at it and everybody wanted to get this done so it was like let's just go 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 the second point in the speed comes to how these things work this idea that these are like brand new types of of vaccines and like i mentioned that's maybe not um entirely the best way to think about it because they still work on the same principle you know using your body's natural process of when you get infected identifying the pathogen or a piece of the pathogen and building antibodies to it so that you have this stored immune response. Um, These are the same. And like all vaccines, they are just finding a way to provoke that immune response without you actually getting infected and actually getting sick. Um, So to understand how mRNA vaccines, these DNA vaccines, these, sorry, not DNA, these RNA vaccines, uh, genetic vaccines, how they work. Let's go back and just do a quick review of like high school biology. So there's two types of genetic material in the body, DNA and RNA. Um, These are two languages dealing with the same thing. DNA is the language that our genome uses. So your, the human genome, the dog genome, everyone's genome that's found in our cells that contains the recipe for all of the proteins needed to make a living thing is written in DNA. So every living thing ha- is made of proteins. These mole- these molecules that are put together, assembled inside of our cells, um, they make up everything, uh, every part of a living thing. Um, how the body unlocks the recipe from the genome in DNA and then builds the protein, organizes them, processes all of them into a workable living thing is by translating sections of the DNA from the genome, these are the genes, uh, into short RNA messages that provide the, the description, the recipe to make a single protein. So the reason that it's it's translated into another copy, there's a, a number of reasons why you would translate it from DNA to RNA, um, and one of it, the reasons that you know is 
that RNA isn't as stable as DNA. So once it's been read by the protein making machinery of your cell, the body either chops it up or it kind of just degrades. And that way your body isn't just when it, you know, takes a, a gene that it wants to make from, you know, copies the recipe out of the DNA into the RNA and then brings that to protein making machinery and makes it, it doesn't just keep making it nonstop. The fact that messenger RNA or the short RNA messages called messenger RNA, um, the fact that they degrade is, you know, one of the mechanisms in which we control how much protein gets made of different things um, from different genes. Um, so messenger RNA, these short RNA messages, that's mRNA. That's where that comes from. Um, the point is, is that messenger RNA are these instructions for your cells to make proteins. And this is the great promise of mRNA technology is that if you can read the genetic languages, uh, understand them, and then you can write your own um, messages, you can write your own messenger RNA to make proteins, you can then instruct your body to make whatever you want, to make any of these proteins that you want. So there's two things, there's two components to mRNA technology. We have to be able to understand the genetic code, what it means, and reading DNA and mRNA, understanding that language, check, done, we've sequenced the human genome, we've, we're, we're really good at that. You then have to be able to build messenger RNAs in a lab. So that's just some, some biochemistry stuff. You got to put the building blocks together in the right order based on your recipe um, and get it to be stable, you know, have the right conditions to get it to be stable. And then you can, you can, yeah, start writing messages, start giving your cells instructions to make certain things. So you could do things such as uh, help your body recognize cancer as a bad thing and direct the immune system to kill it. So this is one of the promises, the long time promises of mRNA technology is to make cancer vaccines, personalized cancer vaccines for the own cancer that you grow, unfortunately, in your body, you might be able to create a, an mRNA message that will direct your cells to kill that cancer. Um, you could make uh, other proteins that your body is missing due to you missing a gene. So some diseases like cystic, cystic fibrosis, I believe, um, some of these Huntington's disease, these genetic diseases where if you are missing a gene, you cannot make an essential protein which causes you to get sick and die. You could substitute that by creating a messenger RNA and taking it. Maybe you got to take it every day, every week, who knows? Uh, but then your body would create that protein and you wouldn't suffer from that disease. So this is like, it's really powerful technology, actually, when you think about biotechnology. It's, it's really amazing. Um, and people have been working on this idea since the 1990s. In fact, Stat Magazine had a great piece on the history of this, and it goes back to a woman named Catalin Carioco. I apologize if I'm butchering the name, but she's now a senior vice president with BioNTech, uh, the company that partnered with Pfizer to make the coronavirus vaccine. You know, she struggled for years to get people interested in this idea. And she is essential in getting this technique to work because at the beginning, when you built these messenger RNAs that you wanted to then give to the body so that it could be instructed to do something, um, the immune system would recognize them right away as, oh, hey, this is an, um, an, an RNA that has been built outside of the body and it didn't come from us and that kind of thing. So it had this immune response. So they had to do some chemistry, some working around her and a, a colleague by the name of Drew Weissman figured out how to get around this. Uh, we won't go into the details there but it involved altering one of, the, one of the building blocks of RNA slightly, you know, at the molecular level, chemically, just so that the immune system wouldn't immediately recognize it. Um, and they made this breakthrough in 2005. And so since then, scientists have been working with this mRNA technology for a ton of different projects, including vaccines. So 
now that we've done this little history on messenger RNA, what it does, it's the, you know, the, it carries the instructions to your cells to make different proteins. If we can write our own messages, we can get our own cells to make whatever we want them to, whatever we need. Um, we're ready to, to jump into the vaccine part. And there's a couple of things I want to mention here. This is, this is, it is new technology in that these vaccines, a vaccine of this nature hasn't been, been done before on a wide scale in humans. But you can see that this, people have been working with this since as early as 1990 and really since 2005, people have been working on this in the lab and stuff. So it's not as new as, you know, the headlines or maybe some of the anti-vax Facebook posts you see will have you believe. Like this has been studied, this technology, this theory of, you know, directing yourselves to make things has been done for a long time. So this comes again to, in terms of speed, you know, why this technology has been able to be adapted so fast. One, it's because we have done, you know, 15 years of groundwork with mRNA technology in general. Since 2013, I think there have been at least seven phase one, phase two trials of mRNA vaccines. So the using them to make vaccines isn't even entirely new those phase one and two trials will have had humans in them. I think it's like, you know, maybe like a thousand people. Uh, The Ebola vaccine is based on this technology. So it's not that new, you know, in the sense of like time. It's been, people have been working on this for a really long time. And it's not the first time that humans have ever been introduced to these types of vaccines. So that's that's not what people mean when they say it's new. It's new in that this was probably the first time that an mRNA vaccine is approved for such widespread use. And again, that comes back to the need that we have, the urgent need that we have. So mRNA vaccines, what they're doing then is they're, you're writing a bit of messenger RNA that instructs your cell to build a piece of the virus, a viral protein, rather than making a protein, you know, that's coded for, that's written in your DNA, you're making, you're instructing your cells to make a protein that comes from the instructions of a virus. And once your cells do that, your immune system can recognize that protein. And that's the that's the vaccine provoking the immune response. So, like I said, rather than having to culture up virus Fresh, and virus. grow it in a lab and do all of that process, you can just whip up a bit of this messenger RNA, introduce it to your cells, your cells create the protein, do all that work, and you get your immune response. So the reason that we're doing this now, again, need urgent, urgent need. Two, we've had, you know, the decades of of groundwork leading up to this point, all the experiments, all of the original clinical trials for other viruses. They've done it for, I think, Zika, uh, rabies. um, I can't remember. There's a couple others that messenger RNA um, vaccines have been trialed for, but we had all that body of work and we have the ability to rapidly sequence genomes and build, you know, messenger RNAs and other genetic molecules. So it's like, it's kind of the perfect storm of all these concepts that have allowed now when we need this urgent vaccine, it's like, okay, this mRNA vaccine technology is ready to go. So let's pump the money into it and let's give it a try because it could be revolutionary. And the way that they're looking, it, it, they appear to be working really well in the in the clinical trials and stuff. So the scientists in China were able to uh, sequence the virus within like months of it appearing, 
um, they made that public to the world. So then all of the other companies, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, uh, you know, they could look at those genomes and say, well, which let's pick a couple proteins that we think the immune system will react to and we can provoke a response from, you know, to create our vaccine. Uh, so that's our ability to do that to sequence genomes is part of this and great we could do that really quick and the technology in terms of building messenger rnas is like i said really good as well when i was doing my phd i would order chunks of r of dna from my laptop for like 10 bucks a pop so we were really these technologies are so well developed that it's like it's a, again a reason why these things can can come out so fast is because you can instantly identify what target you want to target from the viral genome and then just make these rnas and get to work testing them um and that's what they did i think moderna already had a couple of coronavirus uh vaccines ready to go just for a different coronavirus. So all of these things working together have led to the point where we can, like I said, this was the moment to do it. Um, so there was no corners cut. The technology has been thoroughly studied. It's not brand new in that sense. Um, and there was companies ready to go because they had been trialing different vaccines for different viruses for these things using this mRNA technology for a long time. So hopefully that explains to you a little bit why this, um, why this has come so quickly and why people are talking about this as, as being like this brand new technology, this revolutionary technology. And make no mistake, it is revolutionary. Um, like I said, if you know, the way that these things look to be working, appear to be working, it shows that, you know, for a lot of viruses, all we have to do is just sequence it and then build these messenger RNAs. And now we have this great uh, proof of concept. The other, the, the, the hurdle that's been overcome in the last little bit is the delivery mechanism. So like I said, if you put these messenger RNAs into the body, um, the immune system can recognize them as foreign right away uh, so you you got to package it in something and this is where the adenoviruses or the chimpanzee viruses come in and what you're doing is you're taking a virus that will get into a human cell you know just like any other virus but it's not going to make humans sick because it's we know it won't make us sick because we 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 know the virus we know what it is um and inside of that virus, you have this instructions for this one protein, this messenger RNA for this one protein. And basically, the virus is just the delivery system. It's just the bus that takes the, the mRNA to the cell and lets it get in there so your body can make the vaccine product, the, the, the immune-provoking protein. Um, and that's where I think we need to go next is... Um, safety right this is the, the other part of this conversation so people were worried about why did these things come so quickly uh and it's it's brand new technology so that's weird and you're hearing about you know we're using viral messenger rna or chimpanzee viruses these adenoviruses to infect our cells and make uh make our make ourselves make virus protein it sounds crazy and it sounds like um something's going to happen to my dna like i'm going to get a mutated strain of the virus or it's going to come in and mutate my cells uh and blend with my dna and all this stuff and it's just not true that's just not how these things work and the main reason is because our bodies cannot translate RNA back into DNA. We just don't have the enzyme that does that. Um, we can translate DNA into RNA, and then it goes on to the protein making machines, but we can't go the other way. So there's no risk that a messenger RNA that is the recipe for a viral protein is going to somehow integrate into your genome and then you're going to be constantly creating these viral proteins and you know 
it's going to wreak havoc or it's going to mutate or something like that. That's just not how it works. And when you think about um, how viruses actually work, how real, like, you know, full, full on viruses work, how they infect our cells, it's the same process. So if this were possible to happen in that, you know, a viral messenger RNA could somehow interact with your own genome and, and add in there and, you know, fuck up your DNA, this would be a risk with like every, any virus, right? Because viruses themselves are getting into your cells, injecting their genetic material into your cells, which then your body reads, your protein, your cells, protein making machinery reads and creates the virus proteins, all of the proteins needed to make, to replicate that virus. That's what in viral infections do. And they do this in a manner, you know, that they don't turn off. They just make more and more and more and more and more of themselves. And then they have genes in, that code for proteins that kill your cell and like blow it up so that all of these new viruses, newly created viruses that can then go and infect other cells. So the using, this is why using um, a modified chimpanzee virus or adenovirus or something like that as the delivery system works really well because it's a natural process. It's designed to go to your cell and put this messenger RNA inside your cell. Um, so that's why we're using those. So it's not that crazy. It's a normal process. It's a natural process. We've just changed what the package is. So instead of the package that the virus will be delivering to uh, your cells, instead of it being the instructions to make a whole virus and kill the cell and then go on to infect other cells, it's only carrying the instructions for one part. And again, this is our advances in technology, biotechnology, that we can actually, you know, change what the package inside the virus is. Um, and not all of the vaccines use viruses. Some of them, like I said, you can you could put it in a in a globule of fat or something and get it to go into your cell, uh, get the messenger RNA to go into your cell. But anyway, the point is, is that we don't have the enzyme to go from RNA back into DNA. So there's no risk that it's going to fuck up your genome. Um, and then number two is that it's not the whole virus. The instructions to make the whole virus are not there. It's just a single piece. So you think about it as like you have the blueprint to 3D print uh, a car tire. You could print that car tire. You could make a bunch of car tires. You could recognize that it's a car tire and that it's meant, you know, for a car, but you wouldn't be able to build the whole car and you wouldn't be able to drive anywhere. So what these vaccines are doing is they're giving your cells the instructions to make a few viral tires. The immune system knows what they are, builds the antibodies against them, but the whole car never gets built and therefore, you know, can't go, the virus can't go fast and furious all through your, all through your body. And then remember, because mRNA degrades so quickly and is destroyed by the body, it doesn't last. So you make the proteins, you get the re immune response, you get the antibodies, and then it's gone. So it's, I hope that that's not as scary as, you know, you would, it originally sounded. Um, and, you know, this, the fact that the mRNA gets destroyed qu so quickly was one of the, one of the things that uh, clinical trials and other um, experiments have to figure out is what's the right dose so that we don't over stimulate the immune system, but that we still get enough protein production before all the mRNAs are destroyed. And that's what, you know, clinical trials and the decades of groundwork beforehand have been working on. Real talk. These things are not going to mess up your genome and they can't mutate, they can't create the whole virus and mutate and cause some super virus and make you really sick. It's just, it's just not possible. So finally, the last thing that's been coming up a lot is the long-term effects. Now, it's true that for these specific coronavirus vaccines themselves, 
we won't have long-term data until a long term has passed, right? So we have the clinical trials that have been done for these specific vaccines, and every day we get more and more data, every day we get more and more long-term data, right? And so I understand that people are like, well, that's that's crazy, you know, for other vaccines we have, you know, years and years of, of, of long-term data, and yeah, that's because we made them years and years ago. Uh, and maybe there wasn't such a, an urgent need um, for them that we waited years and years before approving them. But it's not, it's not the same. Like I said, we have this, this, this urgent need for speed. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have time to wait. Uh, but this isn't really anything new. You know, so with the other vaccines that I said, like that you may have waited years and years and years before getting approval, the same process would be would be going on um, in that you would be giving it to people and seeing what happens, seeing if they get sick, uh, seeing what the uh, reactions to it are, uh, noting which populations have severe reactions and which ones don't, all of that kind of thing. So again, the process hasn't changed. We're just kind of um, all watching it now. And it's and it's happening on a larger scale and a quicker scale. And that is, again, because there's so much virus going around so that we can do these things. And uh, we need to. So yes, it is true in a sense that there is no long term data. But again, the system this is what you would be doing with any medicine is rolling it out and seeing what happens and carefully watching and carefully recording it. Uh, the, again, and the reason that it's happening now sort of in, in front of all of us is because of that need, because of the media, uh, you know, interest in it, all of our interest in it. And because it's been given what we call an emergency use approval, which means that they can give it to a lot more people because there's as the, name suggests an emergency so this was the same thing that was done with the ebola vaccine um and if we look at the ebola vaccine which used a i believe a chimpanzee virus uh to deliver the vaccine um there's been no long-term problems with that uh and that was in 2015 i believe 20 no maybe 2016 2017 something like that like i said going back to 2013 People have received these types of vaccines, again, albeit in small populations, but there's no reason to believe that there's some crazy long-term uh, effect that would pop up five, ten you know, years down, down the road. Um, and just the way that vaccines work, you know, they stimulate the immune system to create the antibodies. It's a natural process, and then, then the vaccine is gone. It degrades and stuff. There's really no reason to think that it would cause a, a long-term reaction, you know, and anything that any serious reaction, you would expect it to show up right away as your immune system has been provoked. So um, people that have immune system disorders, uh, people that have allergies, you would expect them to maybe have problems with these things. Um, people with autoimmune diseases, they might have problems with these. These are all sort of the theoretical things that you can think of if you're a biologist understanding how vaccines interact with the body. Those are the things you might think of. So there's not really a, a reason to believe there would be some kind of, you know, something that would pop up 20 years from now or five years from now and, you know, you would be screwed. Um, but we also, you know, if you look at the alternative of coronavirus, it's like you're, we kind of know that what the odds of getting really sick from coronavirus are. They're higher than a vaccine. Uh, and we also don't know what the long term effects of having a bad coronavirus infection are. We're starting to see that, that you know, the long haulers, as they're called. So it's, you know, how do you want to, which one do you want to take your chances with? Uh, I would say the vaccine. Um, and like I said, it's not like they're just, this has been approved and then boom, roll it out. Hey, what are you, you know, it's done. Whatever happens, happens. People, because it's an emergency use approval, 
they have to continually monitor uh, very closely what's going on. Um, and even in general, with all vaccines, there's different agencies in all the different countries that monitor vaccine safety. So even the ones that we've been using for 10, 15 years, you know, there's, there's, they're still collecting data, you know, to say, to see if there's anything that pops up, if anything, you know, is, is weird. Um, and it's not, it's not happening. Um, in the UK, we can see the system working because two nurses with a history of severe allergies, meaning, you know, they carry EpiPens, they have these bad anaphylactic reactions to things, uh, reacted to the vaccine pretty substantially. We don't know if that was because of the vaccine interacting with their immune system, or maybe they were allergic to, you know, latex in the syringe stopper or something. Uh, we don't know. But now we have the recommendation that people with severe allergies, maybe they don't take it. Um, the clinical trials also haven't been done yet on children. So anyone 16 and younger were not included in the large phase three trials. So we don't have safety data yet for children. So they're not going to get it right away. So you can see that there's all of these processes involved that are making this, you know, safe. And this is exactly what you would do with any new medicine. It just feels like it's, it's, it's something different because we're all dealing with coronavirus. It's a global thing and we all want to see this. So we're all watching and we needed to get this out quick, right? So, yeah, I guess in a sense, you could say there's a bit more risk with these vaccines because they're going out with the emergency use prov provision. But it's, again, I hope that you the takeaway message is that this really isn't as crazy as it, as it sounds. It sounds worse than it is. Um... And like I said, we have good systems in place to monitor this. We have a good understanding of the technology. We have a good understanding of vaccines and how they work. We have robust regulation uh, and safety standards that are all being met. So really, some of the areas of concern um, that have been raised by vaccine specialists and stuff don't really have to do with safety, but it comes down to whether people can still transmit the virus once they've been vaccinated. So the data that you get from a clinical trial will show that the vaccines are preventing disease. We, we can see that, you know, all the people that got sick were in the placebo arm. Nobody in the other arm the, the, that actually got the vaccine got sick, right? But what we don't know is whether those people were still you know, getting virus in their nose cells, in their lung cells, whatever, and it was just getting kept to a level that it couldn't um, make them severely sick, but maybe they could still breathe it out, maybe they could still pass it on. And that's really going to impact how well these vaccines curb the pandemic, and it's going to change, you know, the, the levels of people that will need to get it in order to sort of reach uh, a point where there's, you know, where we're breaking transmission in the community, that kind of stuff. There's also the issues about it needing to remain super cold. Um, how do you know, what if what if it doesn't remain cold, and it spoils and and people get a, a dud batch, you know, there's things like that. Um, that are of concern. And then of course, how long immunity lasts. All of this we won't know until we roll it out and collect more data. So that's again why this is like, it's a normal process of any new medicine, of any new vaccine. We're just doing it on a larger scale, a little quicker because we have such an urgent need. Um, final point I think I'd like to make about these vaccines is from the clinical trials and stories of people getting the first doses what we're hearing is that a small percentage small percentage being like 0.2 percent or something will have intense side effects so it's very normal to have some kind of mild side effect to a vaccine a uh, sore arm uh, maybe you get fever chills something like that um, which is actually a really good thing because it shows that your body is developing the immune response to the vaccine or to the to the target, right? Um, that's what you you know that's that's why you get fever and chills and all those things it's because your immune system is ramping up and 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 reacting to that 
uh, vaccine. Uh, so that's a good thing. But what we're seeing is that, or what we're hearing is that in a very small percentage of people, these normal side effects, reactions can be quite intense, like I said. So really bad headache, like really bad headache, uh, fevers, really high fevers for like uh, 24 hours. So this is like you could, if you get it, when you get it, um, and especially after the second dose of the Pfizer one, um, you can expect that maybe you're going to get, yeah, you're going to feel really shitty for like a day, maybe two. Um, and that, that it's, it's important that people know that so they don't freak out. And so they don't run to Facebook and be like, Oh, this made me sick. I, you know, I feel like shit and I'm going to die and all this. I mean, I read, um, one article where, um, I think it was a healthcare worker who took it got one of the first doses was like, yeah, I was worried. I was worried because it was, uh, it was, you know, really high fever, terrible headache. Uh, but then it went away and I'm fine now. So I think that's important that people know is that the, your immune system, when it reacts to this, it might be, might be a little intense for a day or two, but that is okay. You know, um, call your doctor if you're feeling sick. Um, but you should be fine within, you know, a day or two. Um, and yeah, so we're, 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 we're looking pretty good, I would say, with these, with these vaccines. Um, maybe people with allergies need to watch out. People with autoimmune disorders, you know, will need to be careful. Talk to your doctor. Um, and we will continue to get more data as we, as we go along. Um, this is, this is the process. So again, I hope that this helps to, to understand why these things happened, why these things were, we were able to develop them so quickly. Um, uh, you can hopefully understand now how the technology works and realize that there's not really any risks for crazy genetic side effects or anything like that. And understand that this process is ongoing and that it is still being monitored and there are no corners being cut. So I want to say that to me, the vaccine is good news and it's promising. But we are still likely a while away from being back to, you know, quote unquote normal. Maybe even a year. Who knows? It depends on how how smoothly the rollout goes, how quickly we can create all the doses that we need. Um, it will depend on what we're seeing from the data, the continuous amounts of data coming in that will help us better understand which, which groups of people might be more affected or less affected um, by the vaccine um, reactions. Uh, we will need continuing data on how long immunity lasts and like I said whether we can still transmit it stuff like that but the only way we're going to get that is by rolling out the vaccine so everything's normal everything's good we're in a good spot um and I think and this is you know just my opinion from having done all this research on the vaccines and what to expect and then what we know about respiratory pandemics I believe that we are probably in the worst of it right now. And so even with these vaccines rolling out, we will still need to be vigilant with mask wearing, um, social distancing. There might still be uh, pretty strict restrictions on gatherings and certain businesses that contribute to super spreader events like restaurants, bars, theaters, you know, these closed indoor spaces. We could be looking at that for a while yet still. But if we remain vigilant on those things, even just, you know, like put in a really good effort to help get the levels down through the winter. And then as we go into spring with the more and more vaccine rolling out, we let that process play out smoothly, efficiently. We you know, have the faith in our, our, our scientists and doctors and regulatory systems that it's being watched. We are 
collecting all of this data, we might be at the beginning of the end of this ordeal. And that would be a great thing. So to wrap it all up here, I would say that when my number gets called, if I'm able to get the vaccine, I'm going to do it. I'll gladly get the vaccine. The chances of something bad happening to me, healthy guy, no allergies, no autoimmune disorders, you know, middle age dude uh, are low. And for basically everybody, the odds are better than getting what would happen to you if you get coronavirus. So yes, I will get it. Um, and I will get it because there will be people in my community in my life that can't get it. I know people with severe allergies. Um, I know people with autoimmune disorders who might not be able to get it. I know young people who won't be able to get it right away until we get more data. Uh, and that's why I will get it, to do my part, just like wearing a mask, just like reducing my contacts, just like all of those things, we're doing it for each other. I hope that this helped to clear up maybe some of the gray zones and misinformation that might be floating around there that might be creeping in and not, not even misinformation in a malicious sense, but just in a, it's not been fully explained sense. Um, I hope this helps uh, to ease some of your fears and just let you make a more informed decision about what you want to do. Um, and yeah, I hope that we can all remain vigilant and get through this. Uh, and that by this time next year, we are talking about uh, other things. All right, folks, thanks so much for listening. Um, like I said, I hope that helped. And if you have any further questions, you can get in touch with the show at 2 brad for you uh, on Instagram and Twitter at bvampiredon on Instagram and Twitter. 2 brad for you at gmail.com if you want to email the show. And the website is 2 brad for youwordpresscom Please subscribe, rate, comment, all of that great stuff if you're listening and following. Lovely. Um, please do reach out. Stay safe, everyone. And we'll catch you next time. Bye for now.